In this lecture, we'll give an introduction to the topic of symmetry in quantum field theory. Um, it's impossible to overstate how important this subject is. So much of what we know about quantum field theory comes from the study of symmetries. Um, for example, we've already seen how Lorentz invariance uh, completely changes the nature of quantum mechanics when it becomes relativistic. And uh, once we have this theory, symmetry continues to play uh, an important role. Okay, so we'll just be scratching the surface here, but we'll have enough to uh, uh, appreciate some of the, the, the aspects of symmetry uh, when we discuss uh, interactions in quantum field theory. So what is symmetry? Symmetry usually means uh, some set of transformations that leave something invariant, for example, a geometrical figure and so on. But what we're really interested in here is symmetries of the laws of physics or of the equations of motion, uh, symmetry of the, the laws, not symmetry of the solutions. So, uh, so the, a symmetry would be then a set of transformations on a system that leave the laws invariant, okay? Uh, so, for example, to clarify this distinction, let's think about, for example, the, the familiar case of orbits, classical orbits, in a spherically symmetric potential, in a central potential, like planets going around the sun. Now, the potential is spherically symmetric, and so the equations of motion are unchanged if we rotate, thing, if we rotate the system about the center, about the center of the potential, right? However, the solutions are certainly not invariant, right? If I have, uh, if here's my sun, say the star, uh, an elliptical orbit might look something like this. So here's a planet at some time, and it's going this way, right? And this is some elliptical orbit, and, uh, and if I rotate the system about the, the center, about the star, I would get a different elliptical orbit, okay? Um, and so here, maybe the, the, the planet would be here and going that way, okay? So this is what I get if I apply a rotation to the system. And the solutions are certainly not the same, right? They're rotated by each other, okay? So, um, but in what, what sense are they the same? Uh, in the sense that, well, if I take this system right here and I do some time evolution, what will happen is that I will get, I'll be, have the same orbit in the same direction, but now my planet will be, say, here, okay? So it'll be a little ways further along in its motion, okay? If I take this rotated system and do time evolution, right, then it will be, the system will be oriented like this, and now my planet, instead of being up here, will be somewhere over here, like this, okay? And now the point is that this system and this system are also related by a rotation, okay? So in other words, it doesn't matter if we rotate first and then do time evolution, or conversely, if we time evolve and then rotate, we end up with the same final state. So this is the sense in which the, the laws are the same, because uh, when I rotate it, I have to use the rotated laws to time evolve it if I rotate first. On the other hand, if I time evolve first and then rotate, I'm using the laws over here. And so the fact that the laws are the same for the rotated and the unrotated system is what makes this diagram commute. This is called a commutative diagram. Okay? So you get the idea that what symmetry is in the case of classical physics is that uh, a symmetry is a transformation that always takes a solution to a solution, right? So the rotated thing, if I have a solution where this planet is ro rotating around in time like this, so here I drew it at two different times, if I rotate the system, I get another solution, okay? And, it, and it's actually this, they're related by the rotation at every time, not just this one time that I drew. So a rotation takes solutions to solutions in classical physics, okay? So what about quantum mechanics? That's what we're really interested in. In quantum mechanics, we again have this idea that uh, a symmetry is something where, uh, where the, uh, the, the, the symmetry transformation uh, 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 commutes with time evolution. It doesn't matter whether you time evolve first or do the symmetry transformation first. So in quantum mechanics, 
uh, a symmetry transformation would take states to some unitary operator times uh, a state, right? So the symmetry is implemented by some unitary operator here. Uh, and notice here I'm using Schrodinger picture. I'll sort of slip back and forth a little bit between Schrodinger picture and Heisenberg picture, even though at the end of the day uh, we'll always use Heisenberg picture in quantum field theory. But for now, let's use Schrodinger picture. It's a little bit more familiar. So for every symmetry transformation, for example, rotate by 25 degrees around some direction, there's a unitary operator that, that changes the, the states. Okay? And the statement that it doesn't that now this is a symmetry means that if we time evolve the new state, that's the same thing as uh, first time evolving and then rotating, right? And so since time evolution is generated by H, this gives us this kind of an equation. It says that it doesn't matter what order we do, that the Hamiltonian has to commute with this unitary operator like this. Okay? All right? Um, okay, good. All right? So, um, oh, sorry, and let's, let's, let's translate this to Heisenberg picture. Let's just translate this to Heisenberg picture, okay? So in Heisenberg picture, um, the, states, uh, the states don't transform under this symmetry, but the operators do, right? They have to transform like this now to make the matrix elements the same, okay? And so what we see here is that uh, if we just take u dagger on both sides of this thing right here, what we see is, well, we see that, so h in particular transforms uh, like this. h is just like any other operator, right? Uh, but this now, by this equation right here, is h. So in Heisenberg picture, uh, a symmetry is kind of what you might think it is. In, uh, it is a tra transformation that acting on the operators, uh, it leaves the Hamiltonian invariant, okay? So that, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, good. All right. So, how do we know what symmetries a system has? Well, if the system is defined by an action, right, so we suppose we have an action and it depends on some variables here, for example, a scalar field. That'll be our example for the next uh, while. Um, and we have some transformation on this uh, that takes old fields to new fields, okay? And just remember, sorry, let me just emphasize that uh, fields are, of course, functions of space and time. So what I'm really saying is we're taking a function of space and time and giving you a new function of space and time by some transformation. Okay, and we'll see examples of, of, of different transformations. But if for this transformation we have the case that the action is just invariant, the action doesn't care whether you're evaluating it on phi or phi prime, then this thing right here we would say it's, uh, it leaves the action invariant. It's a symmetry of the action. Okay? And so the claim is that any symmetry of the action is a symmetry of the motion, in the, or of the laws of motion, in the way that we've uh, described. And so that's fairly that seems pretty intuitive because uh, after all the action is what determines everything. The action determines the laws and so if the action is invariant then the laws should be too, okay? Um, so let's just but let's just you know see that very very precisely. So uh, remember that classically the classical equations of motion come from extremizing the action <clears throat> from requiring that Solutions are special uh, configurations phi such that an arbitrary variation around those solutions vanishes. Okay, they're stationary points. Well, if the action is invariant with uh, under this transformation, then any stationary point is going to be mapped to a new stationary point, and so the uh, it'll map equations of motion uh, solutions to the equations of motion to other solutions. So we can see immediately that for classical physics, this does give us uh, a symmetry, okay? So let's just see a simple example, okay? Here I've been talking abstractly for, for a while. Let's just do a simple example. Let's take our old friend, the uh, free scalar field. So that has an action like this, 1 half d phi squared minus 1 half m squared phi squared. And here I'm using a little abbreviation that I'll, be, uh, I'll find useful to use. So d mu phi, d mu phi, uh, it's 
I'll just abbreviate that as d phi squared. Sort of it's obvious how the indices have to be uh, contracted, and so I won't write the indices, something like this. Okay? Okay, so let's look at this, and you say, hmm, what symmetry do I see? Well, one of the first things that pops out at me is that the action is quadratic in phi, and so there's a symmetry where phi just gets replaced by minus phi, right? Phi goes to minus phi is a symmetry here. It clearly leaves the action invariant, right? And it's also clear that if I have phi of x is a solution to the equations of motion, therefore, that this is just telling me that minus phi of x is also going to be a solution, right? Okay? So that's a very simple uh, elementary kind of example. Okay? Okay. Um, So this symmetry was a discrete symmetry. There were only two possible values of phi. There's only, yeah. So phi prime, if I had phi, uh, I did a transformation, I got minus phi. If I do it again, I get back phi. So there's only a discrete number of things that are being related, right? But the case that I'm going to be most interested in, that's going to be most important for us, uh, is the case where the symmetry is actually continuous, OK? That means that the symmetry transformation is defined by one or more continuous parameters. So an obvious example of that is, for example, rotations. The rotations are labeled by angles, Euler angles or whatever, uh, and so and those are continuous parameters. Okay? But uh, those kinds of symmetries that actually act on space-time are actually a little bit more complicated technically, so I'm going to start with some, uh, some, some, some other examples which are maybe a little bit less familiar. So let's look at a, a simple example of a continuous symmetry, and let's just look at a theory of two scalar fields, okay, phi 1 and phi 2. Okay? And let's say that we have, we have two free scalar fields, so we have d4x, uh, let me go ahead and pull the 1 half out front, and now we have their kinetic terms, d phi 1 squared plus d phi 2 squared. Okay? And now notice we're taking the, uh, the, the coefficients of the kinetic terms to be the same, to be 1 half. That's really just a choice. We're just normalizing the fields in this way. Okay? That's what's going to give us the correct uh, canonical normalization of the states and so on, as, as we've been discussing. So that's not really anything about a symmetry. But now I'm also going to choose the masses of these two states to be the same. Okay? And this is, of course, a choice, because a priori there's no reason why uh, these two guys should have the same mass. But let's suppose they do. So I have two free scalar fields with the same mass. Okay? Now, because they have the same mass, uh, there are various symmetries that I have, that this action has, that it wouldn't have if the masses were different. So one that's very obvious is interchanging phi 1 and phi 2, right? It doesn't matter which one I call phi 1 and phi 2. But in fact, there's an even more symmetry than that, uh, because I can take, I can basically, I can rotate phi 1 into phi 2. So I can make, make up a column vector uh, out of phi 1 and phi 2, okay? And define a new column vector, which is actually uh, made up out of a linear combination. So this is a matrix product of the original fields, okay? So I have, let me use this kind of normalization, and this matrix here is in fact just a two-dimensional rotation matrix, okay? All right? And uh, so this kind of a matrix here we call SO2, special orthogonal transformation. Special means it has determinant one. Orthogonal refers to the fact that it is a rotation in Euclidean space, okay? And the key well-known property of these, uh, of these uh, transformation matrices is that phi 1 squared plus phi 2 squared is uh, invariant, right? Okay? This would be, if I think of these as a vector, this would just be the length of that vector. Okay? Um, now, you can also check that, in fact, uh, d phi 1 squared plus d phi 2 squared is also invariant. Okay? Because when we take this linear combinations, these derivatives just don't act on these sines and cosines of theta here. And the same calculation that you do to check that this is invariant shows that this is invariant. All right? So I would, if that's not obvious to you, I suggest you just do it. Pause the video and take some time and do that. This, these kinds of calculations 
doing these little kinds of calculations is very useful, you will get, um, you know, you'll get familiar with these, you'll be, get more comfortable with these sort of more abstract manipulations that I'm always going to be doing, okay? Okay, so this is, so if with this uh, right here, we see that the action is in fact invariant, okay? And in fact, um, and, and so we have a continuous transformation labeled by an angle theta, okay? Okay, good. All right. Okay, so let's do another example. Let's do another example, which is translation invariance. Okay, so let's look at space-time translations. Okay, and um, okay, and so we'll take the same action that we have before, and now phi of x gets mapped to a new function, phi prime of x, which is phi of x minus a, okay? And so what we have here is that uh, a mu, we now have a four vector a that we're shifting by, and a mu are the parameters, we now have four parameters of this uh, general space-time translation, okay? All right? And uh, it's pretty clear that the action is invariant. If I just change the uh, space-time positions here, the action is invariant, okay? But let's actually check this very carefully, okay? Because it's, 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 worth ch it's just worth checking this. It's worth seeing how you, carefully how you do this uh, um, for the case, okay, for this simple case. Um, all right, so what do we have to check? First of all, we want to check that uh, d4x times uh, the, the, well, let's do a simple case. Let's just do the, uh, let's just say that the mass term. So we want to see the d4x phi squared. We want to see that that is invariant, okay? Well, what does this get mapped to? Let's go ahead and put in the x here. This gets mapped to d4x phi prime squared of x, okay? What is that? d4x phi of uh, x minus a squared. Right? Okay. Now, why is this the, the why is this the same uh, as, as what I have over here? Well, I can define a new integration variable y. So y mu is x mu minus a mu. That's a new integration variable. But because y is just shifted by x, this measure is the same as the d4x is the same as d4y. The integration measure doesn't change. And so putting that together, I just see that I have d4x phi squared of y, sorry, d4y phi squared of y, and since y or x, these are just dummy integration variables, these are the same thing. This is equal to that, okay? So, um, and of course, you can see that this would actually work not just for phi squared, but for any function of phi. So if I you had an action with an arbitrary potential, which was just an ordinary function of phi, uh, this would still work, okay? All right, now let's check also the kinetic term. Okay, here we have to be just a little bit more careful. So we want to check this term now, okay? Well, what is this? What is this? Let's uh, write this out explicitly. Sometimes we have to be, well, some, if, if, if you're ever sort of in doubt about whether some some, some formula is true for some abstract notation, the thing to do is just write it out. So let's write this out. What is this? This is eta mu nu d by dx mu phi of x d by dx nu phi of x. Okay, I hope you agree with that. Now, what, it, what does this get mapped to? Well, all that happens is that the phi's get replaced by the phi primes. So I have d4x eta mu nu d by dx mu phi prime of x, d by dx nu phi prime of x. Okay, nothing up my sleeve, right? And now what is this? This right here is phi of y, right? Where again, y is this x minus a, okay? All right. And so now what I want to do is I want to sort of copy what I did before. I want to change my x's into y's, okay? And so uh, I'm going to have to look at d by dx mu phi of y, right? 
So that's the, that's the key thing. This thing I already know here, this is d for y. I can change that from x to y with no penalty. And now let's look at these factors right here and see what I can do. Well, d by dx mu of y, just in full generality by the chain rule, this is dy nu dx mu by d by dy nu of phi of y. That's true no matter what x and y are. If y is a function of x, then this is true. Okay? But in this case right here, y is just a constant shift. So this thing right here is just a delta, Kronecker delta, delta nu mu. Okay? And so this thing just turns into delta d by dy mu phi of y. And once all these things are the same, I can go back to my abbreviation. This is d mu phi of y. Okay, so if you put that together, you see that, oh, okay, great. Actually, this is just d by d mu phi of y, this is d by d nu phi of y, and this whole thing is the same as that, just written in terms of y. Okay, so in that way, I've checked that, in fact, I've checked very, uh, in, in great detail, that these two things are actually equal. Okay? All right. So we've seen now two different kinds of symmetries, one of which is the symmetries like this one right here, these are space-time symmetries because they actually act on the arguments of the fields, right? So, and, it, and, and you know, intuitively, it, it, it actually, if you picture this transformation, it takes a field configuration that's, say, localized over here and turns it into a field configuration that's localized over here somewhere else. So you can sort of see that it's doing something in space-time. Okay, and these are called space-time transformations, for obvious reasons. Um, the other kind uh, is exemplified by these uh, transformations like phi goes to minus phi and this SO2. Uh, those are not transformations in space-time. What they do is they change the value of the fields while keeping the, the, at each point, but not moving the value of the fields from one point to another. And those are called internal symmetries. Maybe it's not the best name for them, but uh, the idea somehow is that these degrees of freedom that are the fields are somehow inside the particles. I think that was the original idea. Anyway, that's the common name for them. We call them internal symmetries. Okay? All right. So now I want to uh, uh, explain something, uh, a general result about continuous symmetries uh, in classical physics, uh, which is called Noether's theorem. Uh, Noether's theorem says, uh, applies whenever we have a symmetry with a continuous parameter. Okay? Um, uh, so if we, have a, if we have a continuous parameter in our rotation, like for in, in our transformation, for example, in rotations we have angles. Uh, in this SO2 transformation, we also had an angle. Uh, in translations, we have these A mu's. So these are any kind of transformations that has a continuous parameter, whether it's a space-time transformation or an internal transformation. Okay. Uh, let's suppose we have that situation. So let's focus on uh, parameter theta. Theta is going to be our generic name for our continuous parameter. Okay. And we'll assume that uh, theta equals zero corresponds to the identity transformation, okay? And that's how we've actually chosen it. Uh, for example, when we had this rotation by an angle, rotating by zero angle is doing nothing. That's the identity transformation. The same for translations. If a mu was zero, we don't translate at all, right? Okay? Um, and so, uh, anyway, we have this parameter, okay? And so, what we, what Noether's brilliant idea was to consider taking uh, this theta and making it a function of space-time, okay? So if you think about it, before, all of our parameters were just space-time constants, right? So in this uh, transformation, this SO2 transformation, theta is the same. We do use the same theta for all points in space-time, okay? But now, we're going to let theta go to a function theta of x, okay? Now, when we do that, when we do this, uh, the, the, uh, this is no longer a symmetry of the action, okay? So now, s of phi prime is not equal to s of phi, okay? All right? 
Um, so what we so however okay let's let's just think about it how it fails to be a symmetry. So let's expand the uh, change in the action under this symmetry right here. And to linear order, we'll call this delta s because we're going to work to linear order in this. So to linear in order, what does this look like? Well, it's going to be something which is linear in theta, right? Whatever this is, the delta s is by definition the term that is linear in theta. But we know that if theta were independent of x, this would be 0. Because if theta were independent of x, we would have a symmetry. Okay, what that means is that there has to be a derivative acting on theta in this term right here. That's the only way it can go to zero if theta is a constant. And now the coefficient of this we'll just call j mu. Okay, and in fact we'll define it with a minus sign here. That's purely conventional. It's not a big deal, uh, but it's conventional. So we'll do that. Okay, all right. Now, you might say, wait a minute, uh, you have forgotten something because there might be more than one derivative acting on this, right? Okay. Well, if there is more than one derivative acting on this, I can always integrate by parts and put all the derivatives but one over onto this guy. So, for example, if I had a term like d mu d nu theta times some tensor k mu nu like this, by integration by parts, I can write this as minus d mu theta d nu k mu nu, and this right here is what I would then just call j mu, or I would call it a contribution to j mu. So by integration by parts, there's no loss of generality in writing things this way. Now you might say, well, why don't you just go all the way then? Why don't you just go ahead and put this on there? Okay, let me do that. So if I do that, I get plus d4x theta d mu j mu, right? And now the content is, so this is perfectly fine. I remember, I'm always assuming that I can integrate by parts like this. Now the content here is that this isn't just a general operator. It's actually a divergence, a four divergence like this. Okay, so that's, uh, this is perfectly equivalent. But that is what you get. So whenever you take something that is a symmetry when uh, theta goes to a constant, it's the variation under that transformation has to look like this. Okay. Now, the beautiful thing is that if we have a solution to the equations of motion, right, if we have, if phi, if this thing here is some function of phi, and we'll see examples in, in, a, in just a little bit, but if we now choose phi so that it's, a, so we have a solution to the equations of motion, then any variation around a solution is zero. Any variation, okay? So this variation has to be zero for any theta of x. Okay, For any theta of x, this variation has to vanish if we have a solution to the equations of motion. And so that tells us that if we have a solution to the equations of motion, it must satisfy this. The divergence of this current has to vanish. And this is only on solutions to the equations of motion. OK? All right? OK. And so uh, why do we, I, I think I may have already, I can't remember, but I think I maybe said this is a, this, well, this is called a current conservation condition. Why do we call it that? Uh, it's because it has the same sort of form that what we normally call charge and current, uh, the, the local form of charge conservation in, uh, in, 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 in electrodynamics. It has, it, this has the same form. So if I define rho is equal to j0, then I can write this equation here as uh, d by dt of rho minus grad dot j equals 0. Okay, And this formula is very familiar. In the case of electromagnetism, this would be the charge density, and this would be the current density. Uh, in, in quantum field theory, it's, it's conventional to call j mu the whole four thing a current. And just to say that this is the local uh, current conservation condition. That's the terminology that we use. Okay? And just to remind you, another standard construction, when we have this kind of uh, local equation, I call it a local equation because it holds at every point in space-time. Right? This tells me that at every point in space-time, the charge density is changing precisely due to the presence of a current flowing out. And this is true at every point in space-time. Um, 
but I can also make a global statement because I can define the total charge just to be the integral over d3x rho, right? This is the total charge, just add up the charge density at some time. And notice here that this depends on time, okay? This apparently depends on time, but the point is that if I have this local current conservation condition, it actually doesn't depend on time. And to see that, let me write this as q dot, and now let me write this, uh, this is d cubed x, this is just j0, and this is j0 dot would be d0 j0, okay? So this is uh, what I would get using sort of four vector notation. But this is equal to the, diver the three divergence of the three current by the local conservation condition. And now this is d3x of a divergence, and that is equal to zero if I'm allowed to integrate by parts. So again, if I neglect surface terms, uh, I just get zero for q dot. Okay? All right. So uh, now uh, we're going to use this, 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 this thing, j mu, like I've said before, we're going to call it a current, and we're going to call this q a charge, okay, even when it isn't electromagnetic charge. That's, of course, an important special case, when this is the electromagnetic current and this is the electromagnetic charge. But in quantum field theory, this comes up over and over again, and we just take over the terminology. So we'll refer to a current, a charge, not necessarily the electromagnetic one, okay? Okay, so um, that derivation of, of Noether's theorem may have been a bit uh, abstract, but it's actually not just some, uh, you know, abstract mathematical derivation of this great result. It's also actually the, usually the best way to actually calculate the current, okay, what the current is. So let's, let's see this. Let's do this with our example of uh, SO2, okay? And remember that we had this, uh, what was our transformation like? It looked like uh, cosine, we had minus sine theta, uh, sine theta, cosine theta, phi 1, phi 2, right? This was our uh, transformation. Now, let's just write out the, uh, the let's just write out the, uh, the infinitesimal transformations. So we just want for small theta to linear order in theta, we want the transformations. Well, cosine is 1 plus th order theta squared. Sine theta is of order theta. So we see that this is minus theta phi 2, and this is plus theta phi 1. Okay? So these are the, uh, the infinitesimal transformations. Okay? And now what we can do is we can work out how does the action transform under this transformation here, okay? And now let me just remind you what the action is. The action that we want is, the action is d4x, uh, uh, one-half d5 squared minus one-half m squared x squared, okay? Just our standard action, okay? And actually, what the heck, it's actually, uh, let's just replace this by a general uh, function, well, no, let me, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry, this is the SO2 invariant thing, so let me put the one half out here, this is d5 1 squared plus d5 2 squared plus uh, m squared phi 1 squared plus phi 2 squared, okay, all right, okay, <laughs> all right, so let's just take that case, that's our action, good, and now we want to uh, have these uh, variations of phi 1 and phi 2, but now the thing is what Noether told us to do is theta is now a function of x, okay? All right, now if theta were not a function of x, right, we would do this calculation, we would put in all of these, these variations, and what we would find is that the variation vanishes, okay? So just Let's just check that, okay? It's not, doesn't, it's not gonna kill us. Let's do this. We know that this is SO2 invariant, so this is just a reality check. So what is the variation of this? Well, the first term gives me a, a, a I got a factor of two, phi one del phi one plus uh, phi two del phi two, right? That's the infinitesimal variation of this. Uh, what is that? Okay, so this is the variation of that term. Uh, this is 2, and what is delta phi 1? It's minus theta phi 2, so I get 
phi 1 times minus theta phi 2, and then this term gives me a phi 2 times plus theta phi 1. Okay, so I see that indeed these two things cancel each other. Ta-da! Okay? Now, if I, I could make do the same kind of uh, thing over here, right? If I go over here and I do this same calculation, it would work exactly the same as before if the derivatives never acted on theta. If the derivatives never acted on theta, it would just, I would just have some derivatives acting on these phi 1s and phi 2s, but the two terms would just cancel. Okay? However, the derivatives do act on the thetas because I'm Noether told me to replace theta by theta of x. Okay? So what I see from that is that basically the point is, is that the only terms I have to keep are the terms in which the derivatives actually act on theta. Okay? So I can easily keep track of those terms. So what do I have? d4x. And now for this first term right here, I have a factor of 2, d mu phi uh, 1, d mu. And what is the variation of phi 1? It's minus theta phi 2. Okay? And then I have another 2, del mu phi 2, d mu plus theta phi 1. Okay? plus other terms that I don't care about for, uh, for, for, for calculating the, 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 the Noether current. And by the way, it's called the Noether current. I didn't say that. It's named after Emmy Noether, who actually came up with exactly this argument, uh, realized how important it was, and, and everything else. A really amazing uh, and fundamental piece of work. Okay, so for finding the Noether current, uh, the only you can see that if I look at the term where this derivative just sails past this and hits this, and the term where this sails past this and hits that, then these two guys would cancel. That's just the theta equals constant argument, right? That's saying that these derivatives just go along for the ride, okay? But we now have terms where this derivative hits that and this derivative hits that, and those are the things that we have to keep. So I'm sorry. On the left-hand side here, I'm calculating the variation, not the action. I'm calculating the variation of the action under this. And so uh, the twos cancel, and what I end up with is d4x. Uh, and this term right here gives me a d mu phi 1, a d mu theta times phi 2, and I have a minus sign there because of this thing here. And up here I get a plus because of this plus, and I have a d mu phi 2, d mu theta by one. Okay? So you can see explicitly when you do it, you're always going to get at least one derivative acting on theta. Okay? All right. And so now I can just read off the uh, Noether current here, all right, and <coughs> using the equation that I got, remember the Noether current is just the coefficient of this thing right here with a minus sign. So actually J mu uh, it turns out, collecting things a little bit, this can be written as minus uh, phi 1, and this is my little two-sided, fun little two-sided derivative, phi 2. Okay? So this is what the Noether current is, and remember what this notation means. Uh, you know, A left right B is A del B minus del A times B. Okay, and that's what that notation means. Okay, so that's just the translation of this. Okay. All right. Okay. So if you cut. So if you derive a Noether current, you should never believe it. You should check it. So let's just check it. Let's check that if we take the divergence of this current that we just derived, that we do indeed get uh, zero on the equations of motion. Okay, that's not obvious. So uh, let's write out what this current is. Uh, it's actually d mu of, and what, what is it that I got just now? I got uh, minus 
phi 1 d mu phi 2 plus phi uh, plus d mu uh, d mu phi 1 phi 2. Okay, so that's what the Noether current I just got. So let's just take its derivative. Great. Okay, so we write this out. We have four terms because this derivative can act on here, 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 and here. Uh, what are those four terms? We have minus d mu phi 1 d mu phi 2 minus phi 1 box phi 2, right? d mu d mu uh, we write as box, uh, and those are the two terms that we get from this guy. Now I have plus, I get a box phi 1 times phi 2 plus a d mu phi 1 d mu phi 2, okay? And you can see what happens. These sort of uh, mixed type terms cancel because of the minus and the plus sign here, and we're left with these terms that have these boxes. Well, box phi 1 is nothing but minus m squared phi 1 squared, and box phi 2 is minus m squared phi 2 squared, okay? And so now what you see is that this thing, these two terms do in fact cancel precisely when this mass is equal to this mass. If I had a different mass, for phi 1 and phi 2, uh, they, this wouldn't cancel, but the masses are the same, and so this just gives me 0. So indeed, this does, uh, it confirms that this thing I derived with this beautiful argument of M. Noether's is in fact uh, conserved. It's conserved only if I use the equations of motion, which I had to do here, and if I in fact have a symmetric action. So it, all of the uh, assumptions that, that came right into this were used in checking this. So that's all very good. Okay? Okay. Um, so that was an example of uh, finding a Noether current for the case of a uh, internal symmetry, right? Now let's look at an example of a space-time symmetry. Let's look at space translations, okay? So we're going to look at phi prime is equal to phi of x minus a. So this is a continuous transformation, and so we should be able to find the, uh, the, uh, uh, the neutral current, okay? So, uh, so now let's see, how do we think about this in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, infinitesimal transformations? Well, if a is small, right, so we're, we're thinking of an infinitesimal transformation, then we can work out, work this thing out order by order in a just by using a Taylor expansion. So this is equal to phi of x minus uh, a mu del mu phi of x, and then we can, we have higher order terms, but we're interested in the linear term in a, Okay, and so what we see is that the variation of phi to linear order is just minus a mu del mu phi of x. Okay, and one of the nice things about this, uh, the, using this, these infinitesimal transformations is notice that now everything is a function of the same space-time point x. Okay, so here I, it's easy to get uh, confused for these finite transformations because, you know, things are different functions of different, different things. <laughs> but here, everything is a function of x, right? And the price that I pay, the fact that it's a space-time transformation shows up in that I have a derivative is part of the, part of the, the, the infinitesimal transformation, okay? But that's no big deal. Okay, now what does Noether tell us to do? Noether tells us to take this a mu, which uh, up till now is just a constant, I'm just doing a constant shift here, and replace it by a mu of x, replace it by a space-time uh, dependent function like this, okay? And uh, good, so let's see, see what happens when we do that. Well, when, we, when we're, the action that we're going to be interested in is going to be our uh, favorite action, the scalar field action, and for this case, we might as well just use a general uh, potential function v of phi, okay? So, um, yeah, we, we can just do that, okay? So this is our action, and now, let's see, is, is this thing translation invariant? Well, yeah, we checked that, right? We checked that for finite transformations, uh, and it must be true for infinitesimal transformations, right? But now, when we replace a by a function of, uh, 
allow a to be a function of x, this will no longer be invariant, right? And what will be, by Noether's argument, what will be the form of that? We'll have d4x, okay? And then it will have to involve a derivative, okay, acting on a, okay? But now we have two indices here. We have the derivative index, and we also have a space-time index on a itself. And so it'll have this form, and it will be multiplying some general tensor, which we'll call capital theta, okay? So if nothing else in this course, you should you'll expand your vocabulary of Greek letters. So now we've got capital theta. Maybe you haven't seen that before, okay? And we have our uh, conventional minus sign out front here, okay? Uh, and so this is the form that we would have, okay? All right. And so now, instead of a current with one index, we have a current with two indices. And the second index just comes from the fact that there's an index on nu. Okay? And this, the Noether argument just goes through with this index nu just going along for the ride here. And it tells us, Noether's argument would tell us, that d mu theta mu nu is equal to zero. Okay? So we get four conservation conditions, because here nu is a free index that, that has four possible values. Okay? Um, notice, by the way, here that uh, there's no particular symmetry here between mu and nu, and so there's no requirement of any symmetry here between mu and nu. So in general, theta mu nu does not have to be equal to theta nu mu in general. Okay? However, we'll actually see that in this particular case, it is symmetric, but I just want to point out that from this definition, there's no reason to think that it should be symmetric. Okay? Okay. So, to actually find theta mu nu, we just do it, okay? We just actually uh, look at the infinitesimal variation here, and uh, we will just see that it indeed has this form, okay? So let's actually, let's actually do that, okay? So let's look at the variation of uh, this term in the action. Okay? Uh, this actually has a minus sign, but we'll take care of that at the end. Okay? So let's, let's take care of, uh, of this thing right here. So what we're supposed to be doing, remember that del phi is a mu d mu uh, phi, okay? where everything is evaluated at x. Okay? So what is this variation? Well, this is just d4x, the variation of v of phi. Okay, d4x. Uh, what is this? This is uh, d4x. It is just v prime of phi uh, times the variation of phi. Okay. What is this? This is d4x. Uh, this thing right here is just v prime of phi, uh, and this thing right here is minus a mu d mu phi. Okay. All right. So now, notice that, okay, you can ask the question, well, uh, even when a is uh, constant, right, when a is equal to a constant, this is supposed to be zero, right? How do we see that? It's not immediately totally obvious uh, how that works, but if you stare at this for a little while, you'll say, oh, wait, I see it, okay? Because if a is a constant, then I can actually write this whole thing as a total derivative. I can write this whole thing as d mu of uh, minus a mu v of phi. Okay? Right? So think about it because, okay, this, if a is a constant, this d mu doesn't act on the a mu, right? And so it just hits this. But what is d mu of v? I mean, d mu of v is nothing but v prime of phi d mu of phi, right? Okay? And that's exactly what we need to reproduce that. Okay? So when the case when a is a constant, we just get an integral of a total derivative, and that vanishes, since we're always allowing ourselves to integrate by parts. Okay? But now you can see the rub. What we actually have is a mu is a function of x. Okay? So this step right here is not quite right. It would be right if a is a constant, 
But when a is not equal to a constant, there's an additional term where this derivative hits that. And what we need to do is we need to get rid of it. Okay, we need to, well, we need to subtract it off. So we've added it in. Now we need to subtract it off. So we have a plus d mu a mu v of phi. Okay? All right? And so this first term right here gives us zero because it's an integral of a total derivative. Okay? And what we have left for the variation is therefore then d4x. And let me write this in the way that uh, it makes it obvious that it's of Noether's form, d mu a nu, and then this is contracted with an a to mu nu, and this is v of phi. Okay? All right? Yeah, so we can see explicitly that if we make, take this variation, it indeed has a term which is uh, proportional to d mu a nu. Okay? All right, good. Okay. Uh, now let's look at the other term in the action that we have to consider. The other term in the action that we have to consider is a derivative of phi squared. Okay? All right? And uh, what does this look like? Um, let's go ahead and put the one-half here. Okay? Uh, what does this look like? D4x one-half and then we're going to get a 2 uh, d mu phi d mu del phi. Okay? That's what we're going to get. Okay? Um, like that. All right? And the 2's go away. And uh, what does this look like? This is d4x d mu phi. Uh, then I have uh, a d mu minus uh, a nu del nu phi. Okay, because that's just putting in what the variation uh, is. Okay, and now remember that I know that when a is a constant, I am, I am destined to get zero for this variation. So I'm paying particular attention to the terms where the derivatives hit this guy right here. So one term that I have is uh, where this derivative hits that, and that gives me uh, a minus d mu a nu, Okay, and I'm just pulling that out in front. And then I have a d mu phi uh, d nu phi. So that's taking the term where this derivative hits that. And then the other term I have is the term where this derivative hits this. And that, what does that look like? That looks like minus a nu. Uh, and then I have the rest of my stuff, d mu phi uh, d mu del nu phi. Okay? All right? Now, this term has already got the neuter form, okay? This form, the term right here, does not have the neuter form, okay? But again, I can use the same trick as before. I can notice that when a is a constant, this would actually be a total derivative. Because if a was a constant, this term right here would be the derivative of 1 half a nu uh, d mu phi uh, uh, sorry, sorry. I'm going to pull out this derivative right here, d nu, okay? the derivative that got contracted with a. So this would be an a nu, okay? Uh, okay, so this is something that probably you're going to maybe have to do, just slow this thing down and do it at home or do it at your, uh, for yourself. But the claim is that if I pull out this d nu derivative, this term here is a total derivative up to the terms where this derivative acts here, and then I have to subtract those away, I get a d nu a nu times a one-half d phi squared. Notice that this is just uh, d phi squared right here. Okay? All right? So I can collect together all of these terms, okay? And uh, if you do that, If you collect together all of those terms, what you end up with, uh, and you carefully keep track of all of these signs, uh, I claim that what you get is this, d mu phi minus eta mu nu times the whole Lagrangian, okay? Uh, where I remind you, ah, you see I did it. I, this is the Lagrangian density, but we often get sloppy and just call it the Lagrangian. So the Lagrangian density is one the original uh, argument of the action that I started with, which is just this. Okay? And 
these terms right here came from those correction terms when I wrote the, the wrote things as a total derivative, but then I had to you know take out those terms uh, act, you know, with derivatives acting on A. That's where these terms came from. This term came from that extra term in the kinetic term. Okay, all right. So yeah, this is a, this is this kind of manipulation is worthwhile practicing at home. So uh, I recommend that to you, and I'll give you uh, some problems on this. Okay. And so anyway, here is uh, here is the answer. Okay. Uh, notice that as I sort of advertised, it turned out here that the uh, the this. Uh, tensor here is symmetric, right? Eta mu nu is symmetric, and this is symmetric under interchanging mu and nu as well. So it turns out to be symmetric. Later on, well, if you study gravity, this turns out to be a deep fact, okay? Um, but anyway, for now, it's just true, okay? All right. And now, as I said before, uh, you shouldn't just believe this. We should check it. Let's check that this is indeed a conserved quantity. So let's look at d mu theta mu nu. Okay, with this formula right here. What is that? <clears throat> That's d mu of d mu phi d nu phi minus uh, eta mu nu times the Lagrangian. Okay, okay. And so what is this? Well, uh, we get various terms. We're going to get a box phi d nu phi, and we're going to get a d mu phi uh, d nu d nu d nu phi. Those are the two terms we get hitting here. What do we get over here? Well, this eta mu nu turns this d into a d nu, and so we get d nu lambda, right? And we just get, so we just get minus d nu lambda, okay? All right? All right, well, let's work on this a little bit, uh, a little bit. Uh, what is d nu of lambda? Well, d nu of lambda is d nu of 1 half d mu phi, d mu phi, minus d of phi, right? And let's take this derivative. Well, what do we get here? We get, uh, so here we get two terms that are the same here, and so they, they cancel this two, and we get a d mu phi, uh, d nu, d mu phi, from hitting this term. The two terms of this hits this and this. And this term over here gives us a minus v prime of phi del mu of phi. Okay, all right, nothing up my sleeve. Um, and now let's plug that into here. So let me erase this up here. Um, okay, and this uh, equal sign here, what does this turn into? We're calculating the divergence here. Uh, I, first I'm gonna copy these, these first two terms here, box phi uh, del nu phi plus d mu phi, uh, d mu, is it d mu phi? Uh, d nu phi, and now I'm going to have minus this derivative of L, which was d mu phi, d nu, d mu phi, minus d prime of phi, del nu phi. Okay? All right? Mm -hmm. And so now uh, we notice that, in fact, these funny-looking mixed terms actually cancel. Okay? There's a little difference in that some indices are upper versus lower, and that uh, the order of the derivatives here, but the order of the derivatives doesn't matter, right? And so this term cancels that. Uh, and now what have we left with? Now we can simplify things quite a bit. We just have these two terms left, box phi minus v prime of phi, all times del nu of phi, okay? And very beautifully, very beautifully, this is exactly the equations of motion. This exactly vanishes when we have the equations of motion. So we see that indeed the divergence of this thing vanishes exactly when it's supposed to. Okay? All right. Very good. So let's look at the charges of this, uh, of this uh, Noether current. Um, we have to get the charges we're supposed to integrate over space the time component, so that's theta zero mu, okay? And so because we have four of these currents, uh, we're going to get four uh, conserved charges, and we call these P mu. Now that's obviously not a random name. Uh, this is supposed to be 
the, uh, the energy and momentum for vector. Okay? Um, uh, what justifies that identification? Well, uh, first of all, just the general uh, construction, if we take the time derivatives of this, we would get that T0 dot uh, vanishes, and also the vector, uh, the, the time derivative of the vector components of this four vector both vanish. So this certainly looks like the conservation of total energy and conservation of total momentum. Uh, so that makes sense. Uh, another uh, justification for this identification is the fact that if we look at familiar systems, uh, we can see that the uh, energy is the conserved quantity associated with time translations, and momentum is the conserved quantity associated with uh, spatial translations. And that's exactly what these components are. Um, more fundamentally, it's just this is really the definition of energy and momentum. That really is the definition. They are the things that are conserved as a result of time translation invariance and spatial translation invariance. Uh, it's something I always tell students when I'm teaching Newtonian physics is that when we're teaching Newtonian physics, Newtonian physics is wrong not once but twice. It's wrong because uh, Newtonian relativity has to be replaced by special relativity and classical mechanics has to be replaced by quantum mechanics. So, uh, so the only thing that really survives from Newtonian mechanics in all of this is the are the conservation laws. And it's really because they're associated with these very deep symmetries, right? The fact that the laws of nature are the same tomorrow as they are today and yesterday, and the fact that the laws of physics are the same at different points in time. Those result in energy and momentum conservation. Okay. So anyway, that's what this is. This is energy and momentum conservation. So let's uh, go ahead and compute these charges. Okay. Let's see what they look like. So let's look at P0. Okay. Well, just plugging into our formula here, this is uh, d0, uh, sorry, this is uh, dx theta 0, 0, right? Okay. And, and what is this? Uh, this is d0 phi, d0 phi minus eta 0, 0 times the Lagrangian, right? And this in our conventions is plus 1. And so we can write this d cubed x. Uh, this right here is just phi dot squared minus, and then we'll write the Lagrangian and we'll write it out with uh, time and spatial derivatives explicitly separated out, and it looks uh, like this, one half grad phi squared minus e of phi. Okay? And so now some nice things happen. This phi dot squared and that phi dot squared combine. I get a one minus a half, so I get a net factor of uh, plus one half phi dot squared. I get a minus minus here, so I get a plus one half grad phi squared. And this right here gives me again a minus a minus, I get a plus V of phi. Okay? So we see that indeed this has one of the properties that an energy should have, namely, this integrand is a sum of squares, and so it's always positive definite. And so that tells us that the uh, tells us that the p zero, the energy, is always positive, or is, could be zero. Okay, all right. Um, notice now that we have defined the energy uh, twice, uh, at least for free theories, for non-interacting theories, where this v of phi is just a quadratic, is just a mass term, right? Um, we have seen that we, when we define the energy momentum to be an operator written in terms of creation and annihilation operators that just adds up the uh, energies of all of the particles in your state. And now we have another expression, phi, here. Now, you should be able to plug in the creation and annihilation operators here uh, for a free field, and you should get the same thing. And that will be one of the exercises, uh, one of your homework exercises. Let's also evaluate the spatial component. So pi is d cubed x theta 0 pi. And uh, by our formula for theta, that is just d0 phi di phi minus eta 0 i l. But eta 0 i is just 0. There are no off-diagonal terms 
uh, in the inverse metric. Um, here we have to be just a little bit careful because this right here, because our, uh, of our signature, this is actually minus d lower i phi, okay? And this is exactly the components of the gradient because this is d by dx i uh, phi. So the lower i uh, derivative is the thing whose are the components of the gradient. And so if I write this in standard vector notation, there's actually a minus sign from here. I get minus uh, d cubed x phi dot rad phi. Okay? So that is my, uh, my, my, my expression for the momentum. Okay? Okay. So um, the last topic that I want to talk about in this lecture is uh, how we make the connection between Noether's theorem and quantum mechanics. Uh, Noether's theorem is a classical result, the way we've described it, so, uh, but we're of course interested in quantum theory, so what is the connection? So we're going to talk about continuous symmetry in quantum mechanics. All right? So remember, a continuous symmetry, there's some parameter theta that labels which transformation we're doing, and each transformation is labeled by, in, in quantum mechanics, each transformation is implemented by a unitary operator. So I have some unitary operator that depends on theta, u of theta. Okay? And uh, in a Schrodinger picture, it's the states that transform. So the states, for every state, I get a new state, which is just u of theta acting on the old state. Okay? And the operators do not transform. Schrodinger picture, okay, uh, and and uh, so I can expand the the uh, again. Remember in in Noether's theorem, what played an important role were the infinitesimal transformations, the transformations near theta equals zero, near the identity, and so u of theta can be expanded for small theta, and at theta equals zero, the leading term is just one. So for theta equals zero, the Good approximation is that u is just 1. But I want the linear term, and I'll write it like this, i theta times q plus order theta squared. Okay? So this minus i is a conventional thing. The point is, is that it is theta times some operator q. Q is some operator. Okay? Now, what are the properties of, of q? Well, one pro simple property just comes from the fact that u is unitary, right? So 1 is u dagger u, and if we plug in what u is, it's 1. So u dagger would be, this would be 1 plus i theta times q dagger plus order theta squared, right? Because theta is real. I'm assuming it's a real parameter. The q is some, some operator times... Uh, u is just 1 minus i theta q plus order, order theta squared, okay? And so multiplying this out, uh, the first term is 1. The linear term in theta is plus i theta q dagger minus q. And then there's theta squared terms, for example, multiplying this together, but I also have unknown theta squared terms from here. So actually, at this order, uh, I only know this to linear linear order. But this already tells me something, because this is supposed to be exactly equal to 1, and so it must be that this operator q dagger minus q vanishes. In other words, q dagger equals q. q is a Hermitian operator. Okay. So what we see is that the infinitesimal transformations, the terms and the transformations that are linear in theta, are labeled are, uh, are minus i times a Hermitian operator. Okay? So the i is there, so the q is Hermitian. This minus sign, again, is just uh, a convention. Okay? So let's, understand, let's see this, how this works. Uh, for example, in ordinary quantum mechanics, if we look at spatial translations. So <clears throat> in, 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 in the usual represent, position space representation where wave functions are functions of x, uh, we know how translations should work, right? If a wave function, uh, if we translate the system, we get a new wave function, okay? And this thing is exactly going to be the original wave function evaluated at a shifted position, right? This is exactly the transformation that implements a 
shift from one place to another. Okay? And uh, just as we did before for fields, now this is just a wave function, if we expand this to linear order, what we get is minus a dot rad phi of x. A is our transformation parameter. We're expanding to linear order. And we have some terms which are order a squared, which we're not keeping. Okay? Now, in the language that we just said, we said that this piece right here, this piece right here is supposed to be minus, uh, is, is supposed to be the, the, the transformation parameters times a generator acting on the, uh, the states. And we see that this generator right here is just the derivative, which is really the momentum. Okay? So what we have here is that uh, we can identify this piece right here as minus i a dot the momentum. Okay, this, this piece right here is minus a dot the momentum. And you can see that that actually works because the momentum is equal to minus i times the gradient. So there's a lot of minuses and i's floating around, but this minus is a minus i times a minus i if you plug all of this stuff in. Okay? So what you see is that uh, the, the, the bottom line is that I can now go away from the... Uh, from the position representation, go to an abstract bracket uh, notation. This thing is, uh, let's say, the, the variation of this is equal to minus i a dot p times psi. Okay. So what we learn from this is that uh, the, uh, the, 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 the object q, which is the generator of the transformation, right? Remember, this thing right here is sort of uh, minus i theta q, right, in quotes, because I've got three of these things, so I really have a, 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 a dot product like this, right? But um, th this generator right here is, in fact, a, uh, the momentum, okay? And you, you see that I've used the same thing q, the, the q for this generator, and it's the same name that I've used for the charge. Well, that's not a coincidence, because, in fact, this generator is a conserved charge, right? So I can see that, uh, in fact, um, that, that um, if this is a symmetry, right, then u of h is equal to h u of theta, right? And then working, looking at the linear term right here, this tells me that h q is equal to 0. It's, it, this operator q commutes with the Hamiltonian, and so that's exactly a conserved charge or a good quantum number in quantum mechanics. Okay. So in general, it's always true that the, the generator of a symmetry of a unitary symmetry transformation is a Hermitian operator and it commutes with the Hamiltonian. Okay? Alright, that's it for now. <laughs>